but my grandfather was a World War II veteran. My dad was a Marine Corps uh, Vietnam veteran. And I always knew that I wanted to join the Army. Specifically, I wanted to be in Special Forces. So I think the thing that really set me up for success was wrestling in high school. And a lot of people, if you haven't done it, you don't understand it, but I recommend, hey, get out there and give it a shot. So I remember my freshman year specifically, show up there the first day of practice. So I'd wrestled a little bit before in junior high, but man, when you go to high school, if you wanna say it's kind of like the big leagues. So we get there day one and we're not practicing any moves. It's just straight conditioning. So coach is out there. His main mission, I think is to kill us because it is nothing but a smoke session. It's like, all right, you get done that day and you're like, well, that sucked. You roll back the next day. Today's gotta be the day we start learning it. Nope. So this goes on for probably, you know, two or three weeks, I don't remember. But I remember this, guys would constantly bail. So let's say we started with 50 guys, you know, a couple days later, you're down to 40 something, you know, till whatever coach got his magic number. What I didn't realize till later on in life was really that time, um, those times just sucking on the wrestling mat, just being conditioned, not wanting to go any further, pushing yourself, I believe is really what kind of harnessed a lot of myself to be able to get that drive forward. So we lined up, uh, 1987, I joined the Army on the delayed entry program. I was an eager beaver, so literally, I think right after my 17th birthday, sign me up, so I'm ready to go. I uh, graduate in 88, and next thing you know, 10 days later, I'm down at Fort Benning, Georgia for one station unit training as a uh, infantryman. Get done that, go to airborne school. Um, I wanted to go to Ranger Battalion, but at the time, they weren't taking people, so all right, no big deal needs of the Army, where do I wind up? Fort Bragg, North Carolina, 82nd Airborne, 1st Battalion, 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment. So for me, that was actually a great place to grow up. And it was really my first squad leader that kind of gave me, instilled a lot of my leadership skills that I have today. And he kind of gave me this advice. He's like, think about this. He's like, you've got different leaders out there. I want you to take the good that you see with, you know, the leaders that you like and stick it in this pocket. I want to take the bad, you know, still take that same information and stick it in this pocket. Always draw from this one, never from that one. And it was one of those things that really stuck with me. It doesn't matter whether you're in the military, law enforcement, whatever job you have, you're going to have bad leaders out there. That's fine. You can learn something from them, specifically what not to do. You know, you want to see those that take care of their guys, that help their guys during struggles. Those are the ones you want to emulate and always be looking out for those guys. Time in the 82nd was good. I end up going over to Desert Storm. Wouldn't really com call that combat experience. It was a good experience. Um, pretty much done very quickly, but it was a good experience for that short amount of time we had. End up coming back from there. Uh, at that time, pretty much the Army had shut down all their programs, so there's no pre-ranger course. And they were like, hey, who wants to go to ranger school? sign this guy up. No suffering before the suffering seemed like a good thing for me. I spent some time in the 82nd. The grass wasn't that green there. At the time, Fort Bragg had three special forces groups there. You had fifth or you had third, fifth and seventh all right there. So there were plenty of green berets around. You go out to the ranges, you'd see them be doing stuff and you're like, man, I want to do that stuff. So again, I always had it in the back of my mind. I wanted to go to special forces. So I think it was around 92 or something end up going to uh, SFAS, Special Force Assessment and Selection. Successful there. The problem was we had, I think it was like a year wait or something uh, from the time I finished the selection to actually go to the Q course, which if you're in the 82nd, you know, you're basically a ship jumper. So I had to deal with some purgatory stuff. That's all right. I think it kind of made me a little bit better, more eager to go, end up going to the Q course and then um, get assigned over to uh, 7 Special Forces Group. So kind of understanding areas of responsibility or AORs um, for 7th, it was down in Central and South America. So the nice thing was I ended up, you know, being able to speak Spanish, but also got some Portuguese. So um, traveling all between Central and South, you know, doing pretty much foreign internal defense, so teaching. So a lot of, it's not like this is my first rodeo teaching people. I've had to teach people in other languages. I've had to teach people in other militaries. And really to me, it's a life-saving skill you try to pass on. So all these you know, times, it was just a good learning time. Um, and again, like I said, in the 90s, 
what was happening was the schoolhouse could not accommodate um, the special operations training course, which was basically a four week marksmanship CQB course. They just, they were overwhelmed with their eight week Sephardic course, which was to put people in the sinks and extremist force. So which was basically a counterterrorism force. The schoolhouse just couldn't do it. So they passed it down to the groups. And I was fortunate enough in seventh group, our group commander at the time took that program very seriously picked a team sergeant and pretty much said to the team sergeant, hey, you got carte blanche, pick whoever you want in the group. And I was one of those, you know, originally picked to help run that program. So again, was able to train the entire seventh group. I believe, I know we were there, you know, training guys during 9-11. I don't remember if we had already gotten everyone through or not, but I know we had picked up basically the course too. So we had a improve kind of on what the stuff we already did. We went from just basically at a team level, now incor incorporating uh, company tactics, so getting bigger elements of special forces units to be able to work together. Um, so again, a lot of bullet shot, a lot of time on the range, a lot of honing my teaching skills there. And then really the, the validation is when the guys come back and it's like, hey, that stuff you taught me, it saved my life. Wow. Um, so, So, <clears throat> so again, the accolades from that, and I don't really want to call them accolades. It's just your mates telling you, hey, you know, you were able to save their life not being there. Um, is it emotional? Sure. Does it, does it bring stuff up? Yeah, it does. But here's the deal. At the end of the day, it doesn't affect me and my ability. And I think it's important that guys understand there's baggage you collect but that baggage doesn't stop you from doing your business or being a warrior or whatever you want to say. So you don't get away with that much time unscathed mentally. Doesn't mean you got PTSD, doesn't mean you can't function, but there's just some things you deal with because it's important guys understand, you know, we have done things, we've seen things. We've experienced things, but that doesn't stop us from doing the deed. So it's, a, it's an important thing that people understand. You know, prime example. You know, my buddy Joe that was killed, you know, Christmas Eve 2005. I mean, I still deal with that today because I never dealt with it back then. And it wasn't like you couldn't, it was just one of those that, hey, things have to go. You still gotta get out there and get after it. Um, but really for, you know, for the viewers out there, and I'll give you this, cause I think it's important that we share the memory of our fallen. And especially with Joe. So the key takeaway is, is if you do nothing else, right? Number one, remember the name Joe Andres. Number two, around Christmas time, when you go out and buy those fatty Christmas cakes, they used to come packaged two to a package, but now they're only one buy them. I got it. You might be a health nut. Just buy them. Because trust me, we do. I'm not a super big Christmas cake fan, but I do it in memory of Joe. So what Joe would do is he would steal Christmas cakes from another guy. Back then they were packaged two to a time. He would only eat one and he would take this other Christmas cake and stick it somewhere in my stuff. Maybe in my bed, 
in my boot, in my kit. Who knows where they would be at? And I kept going, who is doing this? And I could never figure it out. Long story short, literally, I caught Joe a couple hours before we were getting ready to head out, and he ended up getting killed. So, I'm glad I caught him because that's a memory that I'll always have. It's a memory I always share because when you want to celebrate somebody, you, you try to stick with the good and finding those stupid Christmas cakes, you know, and then catching the Baghdad Christmas cake thief and it was Joe, you know, unfortunately he was taken a couple hours later. Um, his actions though, saved a lot of guys' lives. So, um, just always remember him and, you know, a bunch of guys, you know, like that. He was probably the, he's been the hardest for me. I think it was just because of our friendship, the lineage. Um, but then at that point, you wind up, unbeknownst, putting up mental barricades. So the mind's a powerful thing, you don't realize it. So, did I have friends when I was in? Of course I did. Did I really harness those relationships? I don't think so. And I think part of that was, you know, the death of Joe. So going into a self-preservation mechanism, you put these walls up where I know guys, we do things, but are you really closing the gap um, to build those harnesses? Because you know what? You catch the Baghdad Christmas cake and a couple hours later they're gone. And it's like, you can't mourn, you can't deal with it because you gotta get right back on the saddle and go. Um, so, I, you know, it's just, it's important for the guys out there, you know, regardless what branch you served, regardless what you did, you know, get out there, talk with your buddies, I got it. I may not experience the same things, but, you know, definitely talk about it, it still gets emotional at times, but the more, the more you can talk about it, the more you can get it out, you know, the better off you'll be, and trust me, the, the other message is you're none the weaker for that. But really it's those, it was the, the accolades from those guys that kind of set Warhog Tactical in motion. You know, it's been a great ride. I've had, you know, ups and downs as far as, you know, the retirement process, being an entrepreneur. Uh, unfortunately, the Army doesn't set you up after 29 years, how to be an entrepreneur. There's no magic book. I wish there was. You know, I, I did have the privilege of being a dog handler there. Um, I was actually able to retire my working dog who's with me now. So super experience on that. And that harnessed me as well. So, you know, I mentioned the whole canine, canine training, canine product line. That's a whole driving factor, you know, behind that. So again, it's, it's one of those, when I'm dealing with my LE guys, I'm just not talking, you know, tactics canine out of theory. I'm telling them from experience. So really, you know, I would say, I encourage most veterans, hey, go be an entrepreneur. Cause I, I think there's nothing better than driving your own success. But at the same token, understand this, reach out and get some information because there's no magic handbook out there and, and really look at the field that you wanna do. I love teaching firearms. I love being able to try to take my knowledge pass it on to those individuals. And I hope that God forbid they never have to use the skill, but you know what, they've got the skill. Cause I'd rather have the skill passed on. They never use it great, all the better. But God forbid somebody has to use a firearm to defend their life and they don't have the skill. That's just an outright crime. They understand there's evil, but be skilled, you know, whether it's your firearms, your hands, whatever tools you're using to bring yourself your family members back home safe each night. A 29 year veteran of Army Special Operations and a combat veteran, we please welcome Mr. Rick Hogg. On the military side, these canines are truly U.S. service members. They wear the stars and stripes on their vest and they're willing to die for their pack. They're given the same priority as U.S. service members on medevac aircraft. The lives these dogs have saved will only be known to God. 
but I can tell you from personal experience, from some of these canines on the pavers, their actions on the battlefield is absolutely incredible, and they have saved my life. To my canine Marco, I will never forget you. Until we meet again, buddy, and can throw the ball once more. I am blessed and privileged to have my retired canine Duco here with me today. I thank, you all, I thank you all for being in attendance today. God bless you, your families, God bless our troops, and God bless the United States of America. You are no more armed because you own a firearm than you are a musician because you own a guitar. The instrument is not the answer. The skill to use it is the answer. Suddenly you are attacked by a criminal suspect. What do you do? In your home, you should feel secure like no other place. Remember, we have to be our own first responders. A lot of guys say, well, you can't time tactics. That's a bunch of crap. When they say go, whoever shoots first, bullets into the other guy, generally wins that fight. Be fast and be accurate at the same time, but train to a higher standard. Every situation is situationally dependent. Remember, the word adaptive is defined as the ability to change as necessary. It's not the change that's hard to do, it's the ability to change. Not every fight will start while we're on our feet, and not every fight will stay on our feet. Not all confrontations are going to be lethal. As, matter, as a matter of fact, very few of them are going to be lethal. Don't confuse passing on some rinky-dink, stupid drill to say that you are now qualified. Qualified and being proficient are two different things. Remember, skill is ever so important, much more important than the gear that you carry. What's the single biggest reason that you fail in conflict? It's fear. And we have known since the days of the Spartans, the single biggest factor in overcoming fear is having confidence in your skills. And you don't get skills by luck. The ma great majority of people in the world go through life without ever having to fight but that doesn't mean it is not going to happen. When I saw that gun, when I heard that noise, when I saw these people doing these things, instead of saying, oh no, I said, oh yes, this I can handle. It can happen to you. It does happen to people. And you are not exempt from the newspapers. Now what saved his life, that of his wife, that of his associates, that of his children, what saved his life, he knew how to think. But that's the message. You're not going to be surprised ever again the rest of your life.